For a thousand years, Kerala in southern India was the center of the spice trade. Relax. Yeah, relax. That's easy for you to say. You're standing over there. Through the ages, money poured in, leaving behind a wealth of treasures. Today, if you know what to look for, the wow, riches of the spice trade can there. still be found. Oh, Huge wow. bronze cooking bowls still hand forged in the jungle. This should go exceptionally well, I have a feeling. And at the top of my list, the glittering gold of the Maharajas. I have no idea what these cost, but it'd be great if I was able to buy one. Getting around can be a challenge. <laughs> but who said going for the gold would be easy? I'm Ian Grant. I'll go anywhere and do anything to find the world's most amazing objects. Many have stories to tell and priceless secrets to reveal. Some I'll sell in my shop back home. Others I'll keep for my own collection. It's a crazy way to make a living, but I love what I do, because searching for relics is my obsession. I'm in southern India on the Malabar coast. I'm here hunting for some unique legacies of the spice trade. I like it, it's a nice piece. Fort Kachin is the main port for the state of Kerala on the coast of the Arabian Sea. It may not look like much now, but 500 years ago, this was one of the most important cities in the world. <laughs> and all because of this, spices. <laughs> the Portuguese, the Dutch, the British, they all came to fill their ships with black pepper that was worth a fortune back in Europe. So this is where it all happens. Spices come in on these trucks, block these tiny roads, get unloaded. All the ships come in. The spice trade route. Oh, yeah, that's great. I just shrunk three inches. Right. Yeah. All right, my first pepper delivery. My friend Sonny owns one of the largest collections of spice trade artifacts hey, in all of hey, India. Hey, yeah. It's great to see you, buddy. Sonny has the place packed to the rafters. Woo, wow. But I'm only looking for stuff that's rare and unusual. This is an old Chinese storage pot that the Portuguese would have used. They'd have it filled with black pepper. Then they'd bring it back to Europe and they'd sell it for thousands of dollars. It'll cost me around $300, but it's worth way more back home. But then I see something you can only find in Kerala. Wow. These are urus bronze cooking bowls that were handmade for rich spice growers. The big ones are beautiful and extremely rare. This is a real find. Look at this. Orly's as far as the eye can see. Wow. We have some new ones there. Something like this in a, in a shop in the States. What is that, about 30 inches? 30 inches. 30 they're, inches. They're about 32 kilos. Yeah. So this in the States would retail for about $2,200. I've been looking for Urlis, but they're hard to come by. Sonny knows a place where they're still being made and is willing to take me there. It's a three-hour trip from Cochin to the village of Manar. The metal workers of Manar are famous for their amazing skill, but they almost never let outsiders in to see the process. For me, this is perfect. Come here and I will show you the, where we're making Urli. This is it, huh? A chance to see an ancient art and buy them straight from the source. Yeah. Look out. Incredibly, these workers still make bronze bowls the way they did hundreds of years ago, casting them using the lost wax metal. No electricity, no machinery. Every step is done by hand and in bare feet. With fires burning and molten bronze everywhere, this work is unbelievably dangerous. That's a good reason for everyone to pray before they start. You really want to get them all lit. You can use all the luck you can get. Game on. The Uruli starts out as a rough bowl made of clay. Then it's turned and shaped to get it closer to its final form. Can I give it a shot? It may look easy, but one slip and you have to start from scratch. If I screw this up, I'm not gonna have a lot of friends here. Next comes a layer of special fine clay. And what makes it special? Cow dung. Yeah, cow dung. The dung keeps the clay moist so it can be worked into the final shape. Then, fire, lots of it to dry the clay. This isn't exactly an OSHA certified workplace. These people, they're 
They're working in fire. They had the guy that was turning the early, literally his feet are in the fire. This lady's over here grinding stuff for 10 hours a day. And it takes up to five days to make a single piece. The next step, layers and layers of hot wax are added to create the mold. A lot of wax. As if the place isn't hot and smoky enough. Once the mold is ready, they goop on more clay to seal the wax inside. And while it's all drying, it's coconut break time in Kerala. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> and for lunch, payasam, a traditional Carolan rice dish cooked in a big old oorli. The mold for the oorli is now in the kiln. Once it hits a thousand degrees, the wax pours out, leaving a cavity for the bronze. While the thing is still insanely hot, they drag it to a hole in the ground. My advice, don't be the guy who has to patch the bottom of this thing. If it falls, you get baked alive. A little fancy footwork to pack the dirt around the mold. And then it's time to pour some bronze. Is this where the, uh, the molten bronze is underneath all the coals? Man, it's, it's melting the frickin' flip-flops on my feet just here. The molten bronze is pulled out of the fire at 2,000 degrees with nothing more than a big pair of tongs and some cloth for your hands. This is Krakatoa hot, man. This is just crazy. Working fast, they pour the molten bronze into the mold, filling the gap left by the lost wax. Then, it's my turn. Uh, which hole do you want this thing in? Right there? This should go exceptionally well, I have a feeling. Amazingly, no serious injuries. Oh, I got excited. I got excited. I got, I got a little cocky there. I, that's it. Now, the moment of truth. Did the Uruli come out in one piece? If not, they have to start all over again. This is why they say those prayers. All right, I get to whack open the Uruli. Oh, that was good. You liked that. Yeah, I, I heard you give me a little, ah, ah, hey, but then it all turned out all right. Yeah. It takes hours to chip away the clay. The last step in a process that's taken days. Seeing it made was incredible. Behold a new early. And buying them here at the source, I get a fantastic deal. And here it is, a bronze beauty. It captures the history of the spice trade, and you won't find a bowl like this anywhere else in the world. Bronze is great, but the Maharajas were all about the gold. While in Kerala, I'm searching for rare elephant headpieces. Luckily, I'm here for a festival that only happens once a year. How much would you sell for it? To get there, I'll first have to make my way through Kerala's incredible backwaters. Only seven more miles to go now, or what? When Relic Hunter returns. may not look like it, but I'm hard at work in the backwaters of Kerala, searching for relics from the spice train. Not sure what I'll find here, but it's a great place to look. The backwaters are a huge stretch of lakes, rivers, and canals that cover this entire region. This is the quintessential backwater scene. Hundreds of square miles of nothing but water and palm trees as far as the eye can see. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And everyone getting around in these boats called Ketuvali. They used to carry spices from the hills down to the coast. Now they've been turned into houseboats. It's a great place to relax. And on Sundays, some of the Carolins start knocking back the local moonshine. The spice trade isn't what it used to be, but one thing they've still got plenty of in Kerala is coconuts. Going into the choir factory. All through the backwaters, you find people making homemade rope. They use dried coconut fiber called choir, and it gets turned into lots of useful stuff. To get choir, they start with a guy who climbs up and gets a nice ripe coconut. They pull him off the tree, they let them dry, then they soak them in salt water for a year. 
they whack them open, and then they pull out the choir, and you get this. Once you have the choir, there's all sorts of things you can make with it. And here in the backwaters, it keeps a lot of people busy. This is what they're making. All these mats in different designs, different colors. It's about as green a product as you're going to find. Here's the truly amazing part. All the rope they use in this place, thousands of feet of it, it's all made by hand, one inch at a time. It starts with a pile of loose coconut fiber. The trick is to gather the fibers in each hand and walking backwards, let the spinning wheel twist the fibers into rope. It's an art that takes years of practice. Not sure how she does it, two strands at once, but I have to give it a shot. They're putting me in the game. Do you have anything in a Burberry or something? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Got a tailor-made uh, choir production outfit. It's solid. There's no way we're getting the robot of what I'm putting out here. Look at the thickness there. This is no good. This is a shame. This is tough. This is not easy. I'm going to get kicked out of the choir union. Aha! It's, it's, it's gonna start unraveling my shirt. I'm gonna have nothing on when we're done here. Oh, that's embarrassing. I'm sorry. Seriously, on the face of it, it looks really simple, but this is a crazy skill. I, I'm really impressed. Not with myself, mind you. <laughs> and if you think spinning's tough, try weaving on an old wooden loom in 110 degree heat. Oh, I already did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, left hand catch. And show a little focus, Grant, huh? That was terrible. Wasn't that terrible? That was really bad. Management, they're down here checking out what I'm doing. <laughs> left, left, left. Ah, that was close. That was close, huh? We almost had to write up an incident report for that one. Yeah, can I get a supervisor down here? I gotta be happy I got the hell out of there. After the brutal heat of the choir factory, it's nice to get back on the water. Is this where I do the, uh, the Apocalypse Now thing again? Once you're in the smaller channels, it's a whole other world. The only way to get around, by boat. It was through all of these little canals that the spices flowed through on their way up to the port and made this a really, really wealthy area during that time. When the going gets tough, the tough start padding. You know, wood sticks. Only seven more miles to go now, or what? Just when I'm ready to turn back, I find one of India's stranger jobs. Duck herd. In a place with this much water, it makes sense to raise ducks. But what I don't get is why they use these tiny, narrow boats. Naturally, got to give it a try. Yeah, this is perfectly safe. I don't see a problem with it. Large American in the front of the boat, displacing weight improperly. The herders collect the eggs and sell the ducks for meat, a popular delicacy in this part of Kerala. So this guy's a duck herder, and what he does is goes around in this impossibly skinny boat with that pole, and hopefully not a uh, large American guy sitting in the front putting it all out of balance like this, and herds these hundreds upon hundreds of ducks. Very nice. I wasn't relishing the idea of falling in the water behind 700 ducks. But we didn't fall in, so what the hell? It looks simple enough. How hard can it be? <laughs> oh, this is a bad idea. No, no, don't push, don't push. No, 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 no. <laughs> it really does feel like thousands of uh, ducks in the water. Just another day in the backwaters. The real treasure I found here was the place itself. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. But up in the hills, the big elephant festival is already underway. And that's the big reason I came here. It's my best shot at getting an elephant headpiece. They're almost impossible to find. So let's say I'd like to buy it when the relic hunter returns.